Hi guys, welcome back to the Spurred On podcast and it's interview time today. I've got season ticket holding, longtime Spurs fan and musician Joe Dudridge. Joe, how are you, mate? I'm good, thank you, mate. How are you doing? Yeah, really well. Just before we start, why don't you tell my legions of fans a little bit about your music and where they can find you and maybe then also tell us what led you to being a Spurs fan in the first place? Yeah, so uh, I've been a musician uh, for a good 25 years now. Um, uh, I'm in a band called The Travelling Band. Some of you may know that. Uh, and I have a solo project called Later Youth. Um, and you can find me at later underscore youth on Instagram and uh, similarly on X, it's uh, forward slash later youth. Um, so, yeah, I started following Spurs probably a similar time to you, Barney. Um, <laughs> it's a, sort of like late 80s really hooked by the 91 cup run I was already in by then and um, didn't get to the lane until 96 where I saw Chris Armstrong header in the 86th minute against Man City managed to get my dad to take us along it was a bit of a different day out then uh, but then I moved to Manchester uh, when I was about 18 and then saw as many away days up there and then would get down to the lane as, as soon as I could, uh, could and um, then ended up getting a season ticket around the time that the new stadium was built so that's been my journey but yeah I'm, I'm pretty much at every game now at the uh, at the lane and uh, try to get to as many away games as possible as well and to give people who maybe are a bit younger than us dare I say a, an idea what was it like for you as a, a you know like late 80s school kid uh, at school supporting Spurs were you one of many or was it as it was with me I was quite uh, one of the few I would say there were a lot of back then there were a lot of uh, Liverpool and Arsenal fans I remember particularly yeah I think growing up like just outside of London uh, you know in Buckinghamshire there was um, there wasn't the Wickham Wanderers was there so yeah. you had some people supporting the local team that's good. Uh, but then my brothers uh, all grew up in, in North London in Muswell Hill, which was very much sort of down the fault lines of uh, football supporting for Arsenal and Spurs. So I even remember some some shin pads knocking around the house when we were younger and there were some Arsenal ones and some Spurs ones. And whoever was doing the branding uh, at Tottenham at the time really sucked me in because, you know, I was <laughs> like, I, I didn't want the red. Red was a warning. Uh, but the the blue and lily white was uh, was where I wanted to go and um, yeah I don't know I I felt like it supporting Spurs was possibly a little bit left field especially with the success of Liverpool in the eighties and and then the the growing success of of the Ferguson United side in the early nineties it definitely felt like a real underdog thing I think I think we were playing someone like. Feyenoord in the Cup Winners' Cup one night or something. I remember just thinking, "Have I? What have I chosen here? What is <laughs> this path?" Uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, once you fall in love with Spurs, there's no way back. I think we all know that. Yeah, and that leads me into a question I just wrote down here because I was just writing some notes before I started, uh, and I was going to ask towards the end, but actually, I think it links to it really well. Is being a Spurs fan genuinely hard? Or do we have unrealistic expectations? Because I would say a lot of the kind of, you know, like the Twitter or X um, young people who get really annoyed by all of it think that like being a Spurs fan is the hardest thing in the world. But actually in terms of us having experienced a little bit more through the kind of Christian gross years, let's let's describe them as that, and a few kind of relegation struggles in the late 90s. Sometimes obviously it feels hard to me, but do I just have unrealistic expectations? Because actually comparatively, we're in a really good place. I think you just have to, it's a bit like life, really. You have to enjoy the ups and downs and you have to enjoy uh, the process and the reasons why you're doing things in the first place. If It's probably not the place to be if you're all about glory, like, as in glory hunting. Yeah. But if you're, uh, I think that's why the Mourinho days and the Conte days, um, well, especially the latter half of that was so tough for the club. You know, bless Nuno, I'm not sure he really had a chance, but... Um, I think that everyone could see the process there was unnatural towards what Spurs was all about. I think everyone would rather had Ozzy Ardiles at the helm at that point. So, yeah, is it hard? I think it's not as hard as being a... A Wickham fan. I know, a, not, a, a Notts County fan. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. But any of those clubs will probably say the same thing. You know, if, you're if you've been up and down like a yo-yo 
if you're Huddersfield Town and you had, you know, that horrible season in the Premier League, I'd say that was probably more depressing. But I think, yeah, it's I, I'd say frustrating, yes, because we've been on the cusp of so much glory. But I think if you've become a new fan since, the, say, the Poch days, yeah, I, I can imagine it is quite hard seeing all this pain. But although I was comparing my even like the the glory days of uh, rock and roll in my lifetime, I was thinking about how Tottenham and uh, and you know, rock and roll's kind of the last, you know, my favourite uh, year was 2008 for that. So that's <laughs> the last time we won a cup. <laughs> oh, my God. In- Indy Sleaze is directly related to uh, Tottenham's trophy hall. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, let me come on to, I guess, the man who is going to lead us to the promised land, Ange Postacoglu. Tell me um, how you felt when you first heard that he was, you know, probably a bit of a left field choice as our manager and then how your kind of opinion on that has evolved since. Yeah. Well, I, I have to admit, I didn't know a lot about him. I'd, I'd seen um, the odd kind of frosty interview on Sky Sports news when he was at uh, Celtic yeah. and I maybe vaguely remember him um, managing Australia, but to be honest, I didn't really know what his tactics were like. I don't really fo- follow Scottish football. Um and yeah, so he came in and I think a lot of people had hoped for um, different choices like Nagelsmann seemed nailed on for a bit. And I think everyone was just keen for someone with progressive football, yeah. uh, someone who was going to u- unite the squad, especially, you know, and get rid of the deadwood that maybe needed to have gone under under Pochettino. Um and just have someone, you know, really come in and understand what being a Spurs supporter and, uh, was it was all about. Take some of the heat off uh, Daniel Levy because I think a lot of that narrative had got so toxic that uh, it was starting to become a bit uh, divisive in the ground. I remember some at the, towards the end of the Conte thing, I was starting to yell at the South Stand because you know they were really, you know, being a bit annoying. Really, it was taken away from the football. So, yeah, well, obviously he came in and as soon as he started talking, he, he was a breath of fresh air and you could understand he was a bit of a, you know, real, real down-to-earth uh, character who whose grasp with the English, English language was quite powerful. And after maybe the broken um, English of, uh, of, of Conte and obviously Mourinho was a great communicator, but um, I, I, I feel like having someone come in who could really handle the media well, get them on their side and just get, galvanise the whole club so quickly is incredibly impressive, I think. Do you get a sense with Ange that he doesn't play games in the media or that he's just much more subtle at playing those games with that, as you said, I agree, that kind of great great use of, of the language? I think he just tries to keep the message simple, but he will not take any shit he will not let anyone claim um claim the the narrative in because uh, he, he knows how especially he's you know working in scotland they're like the, the possibly the most manipulative press in the entire world they'll, they'll twist anything a manager says up there and like write write a headline on the daily record or whatever it is up there um so I think he knows exactly what's happening. He's one step ahead of everyone. So, mm. yeah, I think he's. I think he's very clever how he does it. And I, I, but I do think he's honest. And I think he's just quite smart and quick. He's probably a great guy to have a beer with. He's probably a really mm. good laugh as well. So, I think that's nice. And I, th- I think it's good for fans to to see someone on their screen all the time who's they're going to look forward to the press conference. I remember. The Conte ones, and I I back Conte by the way, uh, probably too much. Mm. Um, but he, I remember those press conferences. You'd just be like, "How's he going to throw the club under the bus today? How's he going to, yeah. you know, make Harry leave the club? You know, all that kind of stuff." So yeah, I love him. You know, yeah, and big fan of Ange. Yeah, me too. And in terms of where we are now compared to maybe your expectations for the season are we over and above that kind of pushing for the champions league definitely yeah i i was hoping for to be back in europa league so maybe creeping i mean i don't didn't really want conference league um but just being back in you know playing a couple of games a week to encourage i think another season outside of europe 
would have made it difficult to grow the squad properly mm. because you can't really have high quality players, um, you know, not getting a game. Uh, uh, so I think some form of Europe was my expectation. And I suppose that still might be the case come the end of the season. Um, but already you can see the club are planning for the future, um, you know, with the transfer policy, bringing in players that, you know, are going to challenge for some of the top players in the team. And that's how we need to be. And if you look at City or Liverpool, um, they're, you know, especially City, that's the blueprint for challenging on in, in all competitions. You need to be able to rotate. So I think finishing this season in a position which encourages the club to reinvest and push on is is kind of what we, we want to hope for, really. Yeah. And in terms of talking about transfers and reinvesting in the squad or investing in the squad, are you kind of with this, what is, what is a new policy, but also kind of a throwback to the old policy of the early Enoch days of kind of buying young players who will grow with the club and then potentially maybe get bigger moves Although actually, you know, in the last few years, actually Spurs haven't really been a selling club at all. It's been very difficult for clubs to get players out of Spurs, perhaps to our detriment, actually. But are you in favour of that rather than, you know, what looked like when we went with Conte, for instance, looked like we might be buying more kind of your older players who are kind of box out the box ready, like Perisic, for instance, although we got him on a free, of course. But do you think it suits the club more? As you said earlier, you said talking about managers suiting the what Tottenham is do you think that kind of policy also suits what, where we need to be well it, I think it depends on 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 how much those players are I don't think it would hurt for us to go in hard for a top you know top striker that's probably the position in the Premier League which is harder for a younger player yeah uh, you need like four or five seasons really if you look at Solanke or Ollie Watkins, they've needed a few years to develop into that top player. And I would rather we went in for that British-born striker and went in hard and paid a lot of money for a mm -hmm. player like that. Um, so that would be where I would be at for that. So I think I would rather spend high on British talent that's either young or established. And then, yeah, develop um, the scouting network across Europe um, I don't think we need to be going in for Oshiman for like 150 million pounds. No. I just don't think that makes any sense. He's not really proven in the Premier League anyway. So yeah, I think in terms of selling younger players that we develop, I agree with you. I'm I'm not sure we're in that place anymore uh, necessarily, but I think we just have to be aware um, and be a bit more honest within the club about letting go of players possibly when they've reached their peak before that's been shown. You know. Even with Delhi or mm. you know Eric Dyer, you know the the getting rid of the the old furniture as Pochettino you you know was saying, um, doing that at the right time. I mean that sometimes you don't even know that as a as a, a fan. You know what's going on behind the scenes. Um, so yeah, I think I think the the appointments that they made behind you know all the the guys upstairs um, yeah. I forget the names Scott Mann uh, yeah. yeah yeah exactly I think they seem to be having a bit more of a you know five ten year plan with these transfers and hopefully that will mean that there's a bit a um, bit less sort of uh, panic buying and 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 sort of sitting on our hands with selling some of the talent in the squad. Yeah. Uh, because p players will need to move on at some point, and and that is sometimes a hard thing when uh, when these are players that we like. You know, for example, take Richarlison. If he doesn't quite fit the profile um, of of the, what we need at the club, uh, do, do, will the fan base say well to that? I know he's very popular with the younger fans. Mm. How will that go down? So yeah, it'll be interesting to see how it pans out. He's very cleverly just uh, had that photo taken of him wearing that old pony. Uh, Hewlett Packard Spurs shirt, which makes him make, yeah, make yeah. certainly certainly made me not want to sell him at any point. <laughs> I nearly put that on this morning. I thought, can a forty year old yeah, can a forty year old man wear that pony shirt <laughs> on a on a Wednesday morning? I'm not sure. I think <laughs> arguably you could have got away with it, but uh, you know. So I want I want to ask. Um, you know, I'm a little bit glass half full as a Spurs fan. I'm just wondering. I feel like maybe there's an opportunity for Spurs to really challenge. You know, if Ange keeps the kind of evolution of the style of play and the improvement and the and the squad depth coming as he has done in the two transfer windows so far is there an opportunity for Spurs to challenge 
what may be kind of Arsenal once Liverpool lose Klopp and potentially down the line in maybe a year or two, Pep goes or Manchester City get punished for financial fair play stuff? Maybe, but what I'd say with Arsenal is that they possibly have slightly better younger talent than Tottenham do. And although Arteta really turned things around, and as much as I hate to say it because I really dislike the guy, um, he has done an amazing job to get them where they are. Um, so, yeah, but, but whether our younger players can develop quickly like they have, that would mm. be interesting to see. But I, I don't see any reason why we won't be pushing those clubs uh, in the third and fourth position. And you just don't really know how things are going to gel. Uh, there's so much talent in our squad mm. that if we really find a way of playing which isn't dissimilar to City, where we, we just wear teams down and then we can bring on... You saw the other day against Palace how well the, uh, we turned the screw once we brought on you know a really deep uh, substitutes bench that yeah, made a yeah. massive impact on that game. And I know fans are frustrated, but I think you know watching the game, we were just turning the screw, turning the screw, and then we brought these extra players on, fresh legs, and we, we killed them. So I think that's probably going to be a, a, the situation in a lot of games moving forward. I mean, Arsenal at the moment, unfortunately, are blowing teams away, but I feel like a lot of them are just laying down anyway, uh, saving their legs for Spurs probably. But, do, you, um, do you remember, yeah. do you remember just because I think, I would think about this because I watched the Arsenal game the other night. Do you remember the season? I'm pretty sure it was the season where we came second with 85 points and there was a period where we would just blow teams away. Like Stoke came to the lane, we did them 4-0, we did them... I think it was the season before actually where we did them 4-0 away but we did but suddenly teams were coming to the lane and Kane was scoring hat-trick after hat-trick after hat-trick and it feels to me maybe I'm being a bit um hopeful but it feels to me like Arsenal are in a similar zone but actually in the end it may not be enough they may end up finishing on like late 80s points and still lose it to City that's that's what I'm hoping for Yeah no I'd love that um I think it's what we're seeing now is a reflection of where we're at in the season. As early in the season, when teams are just trying to build points, um, I think they'll set themselves up differently. I imagine where Sheffield United are at now, for example, they don't a, a draw is no go, good for them. They've got to go out and try right. and win games, and I think that is falling into Arsenal's trap at the minute because people aren't really setting up to frustrate them properly, or they're just useless. Um, but yeah, I know what you mean. And equally, I think that the jeopardy involved with the Premier League over the next few weeks will, you know, we'll see against Villa. Uh, I know you talked about it uh, on the pod about how their high line might mm. make them a perfect team for Spurs to play at the moment. And um, we'll see. And maybe there'll be other games ahead of us where teams are going to come onto us more, where they'll actually get surprised about how devastating we can be when teams aren't playing a low block. So we'll yeah. see. I really hope so. My my caveat for my my positive feelings about the Aston Villa game are also based on the idea that hopefully, unlike Brighton away, we won't concede four goals in the first like 45, <laughs> 50 minutes. <laughs> but um, I, well, we've got yeah. we've got fewer injuries than we did that day. That's for sure. Yeah, I think that was a bit. I mean, when you got Emerson Royale and Ben Davis as your centre back pairing, anything's possible. <laughs> <laughs> lovely boys, though. Lovely boys. It's lovely boys. Um, so just coming towards the end, Joe, you know, you mentioned you, you feel strongly that maybe a, 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 a homegrown striker with experience of the Premier League might be what we need to add on to challenge. What about in those kind of wide positions? People are talking a lot about us potentially spending big on a kind of a Neto or an Eza. I'd also like to throw Elise into the mix, potentially, although he's very injury prone. What, what do you think, you know, as well as that strike, where would you invest as well to challenge or to try and push up to that next kind of challenging, which would be kind of trying to push towards second, third, first place? Yeah, I mean, I, I do agree with that. And I know there's a, a lot of chat on, on the Spurs pods about this in terms of how do we try and expose teams um especially when we get into the you know the final those areas you know we and finding a winger that can you don't know what he's going to do a bit of a disruptor maybe what Mano solomon was meant to be someone who can yeah. go both ways we looks very dangerous you know we don't overlap enough in my opinion um but if you can get a, a really fantastic winger who can 
get to the byline and to pull players out of position, I think that's got to be a priority, really. Someone who can do something different to what Cooley does. Uh, I really like Werner, actually. I think he's done a good job since he's come. And Brennan Johnson, again, they've all got different attributes, but we kind of need a Man of Solomon on speed who's not going to get injured all the time, really. Yeah. And you mentioned it a bit earlier, and seeing as you're at every game, it's worth asking, I think. The the atmosphere at the stadium, obviously, it's a, lot, a lot's been talked about, the kind of party time after each time we win. And the atmosphere is definitely, I've been a few times this season, it's definitely obviously so much better than the Conte time. But you did mention, like, it can get a little bit um, antsy quite easily, can't it? And what do you think that is? Is that oh, is that another thing that's, like, expectation getting the better of us? Because like we said, you know, you know, I, I didn't think we'd be anywhere near fifth place at this at this time, having lost, you know, the player who scored 20 goals every season and 10 or 15 assists. And Ange, I think, is doing such an amazing job that we should feel more or we should be more patient and not allow those kind of moments to get us wound up. But is it just human nature and expectation? How does it feel in the stadium, I guess? Yeah, I mean, I don't mind tension in the, you know, in the ground I think, you know, when you see Borussia Dortmund fans and they're just mm. going the whole time and they're not even watching the game, I don't think that's really what English football's about. And, you know, when there's a bit of tension and, the, uh, the you know, you can feel that uh, you want the, the team to do more, um, that can sometimes be good. But I know what you mean. It would be better if there was just a bit more... I don't I actually think these Saturday afternoon games don't help. Uh, either for some reason um, I think that it's, sometimes it takes a while for people to get going I also think and this is quite a difficult conversation but I think we've lost a lot of songs uh, due to the Y word in, in the stadium and the South Stand still sing a lot of them the rest of the ground tend not to mm, I think that stops a lot of momentum certainly in certain periods because you know there's we haven't replaced the Deli Alley song really you know there's there's all these kind of small things that you kind of observe as a as a fan in the stadium that possibly couldn't contribute towards that. But I do think the South Stand really set the tone. So if they've sold a lot of their tickets to some of the Category C games, for example, and there's a load of people sat in there who aren't really there, again, that can not help. So I think everyone showing up, everyone learning the new songs, all that kind of stuff is, is yeah. super important. But I do think on a good day, it's unbelievable. And when, you know, everyone sings at the start with the trumpet and all of that, it's, um, it's quite incredible. So, yeah. um, I, yeah, it's some, some better days are better than others. And, but I do think you're right. I think the fan base could do more to lift the team when we're not necessarily playing as well as we can. I think what you said about the category C games is really worth talking about a little bit more actually because there's been quite a lot of angst and abuse on Twitter, especially of course, after games we've lost, like, for instance, the Wolves game where people have taken photos of a lot of Korean fans in the stadium and are almost like blaming the Korean fans for going there just to see Sonny rather than being, you know, proper Tottenham fans kind of thing. But I personally think that's a little bit of an element of be careful what you wish for, because the amount of money yeah. that, that those fans have brought into our club you know, we'll never get an actual number, but it should not be underestimated. And also every time I've been there at a home game and gone to the club shop before the, the queue of fans who are trying to buy merchandise, you know, 70% of it is probably Korean fans. And that is a lot of money yeah. that we are able to reinvest. And I know there's also, there'll also be a lot of fans who don't want this conversation to happen because business isn't important. But as we can see with a lot of the clubs who are falling foul of the profit and sustainability rules, we should be careful what we wish for in terms of how important that is in allowing us to continue to grow. Yeah. I mean, all fans are, are equal in my, my head. You know, I, and I do, I've sat with a lot of Korean fans where I sit in the East End and, you know, they're, if not more passionate um, than some of the other people around. It's it's more the, um, it's more the non-football fans who are coming on like, you know, the hospitality thing right. or they're more kind of like, I don't know, it's, it's really hard to say. The but people who work I, in media was, sales who are on a jolly. Yeah, yeah, well, I was being kind of more specific to the South Stand, actually, and I'm not, I'm not picking a fight with them because they obviously, they're the leaders of the stadium. Mm. So when, when they're not on the song or when they're pissed off, I, it has an effect on the rest of the stadium. But yeah, I know I love the Korean fans. And, you know, like you say, it, it, 
growing a fan base in any part of the world is is super important and um yeah long may that continue okay and last question joe what is the ceiling what is the ceiling for Ange's spurs next five years where where we if we do this interview in five years time where could we be where do you think we'll be i, th- I think we got a shot at the league i think he wants to go for that um I think Pep uh, might fancy a break at some point. Klopp's obviously going to leave. There'll be a bit of transition there. So it's possible there, there'll be an opening, you know, for us to go for the league. And, you know, especially if we keep strengthening the squad as we have been, the the limits on financial fair play and, uh, and all, all of that in terms of how much people can spend. And we're one of the highest earners in the Premier League. So I think we're going to be financially up there. So... In theory, that should mean we'll be able to compete for all the all the highest competitions, you know. So I'm yeah. I'm positive that we can get that get that trophy, but I'm definitely not just about the trophies. I want to see like a consistent long term success, really. Yeah. Um, bring Champions League football back. So dangerous common sense from Joe Dodge there. I'm just going to say uh, I don't disagree with you on the league, but I have a sense that we will have a, more of a chance of winning like a European trophy. I'm even going to say, I think we've got more of a chance of winning the Champions League in the next five years than we do the league. And that is based on, it wouldn't surprise me at all if as this profit and sustainability rules thing starts to bite harder, the Premier League as an entity and the money men start to worry that the best players aren't going to all come to the Premier League anymore if the clubs can't afford to buy them. And then at some point they'll be like, well, we're ruining our own brand with this rules and they will lessen the rules just as Spurs are about to hit the mother mm. load of potential having stuck to the rules so well. So that's kind of why I think we'll have more of a chance at the Champions League or, or one of those European trophies. But also, obviously, I think we are building and it's been really good. Okay, before we finish, Joe, tell them once again where they can find your music. Go and listen to uh, Later Youth, The Travelling Band uh, and other music of yours. Yeah, well, you, you got it. Uh, thetravellingband.com or on Spotify or lateryouth.com. Um, yeah, look me up on Instagram as well, later underscore youth. Top man. Thanks so much, Joe. And thank you, everyone Cheers, at buddy. home for watching and listening. Don't forget, press the like button and subscribe if you're on YouTube and go over to the podcast platforms, wherever get you get your podcast. Type in the Spurred On podcast. Give me a follow and a subscribe. And you can be a member, a Spurred On Pro member or a Patreon member. All the info is in the description box. Just one pound a month. Thank you very much. And most importantly, come on, you Spurs.